we have this letter. Letters are so last century. <laughs> when one has access to instant global news, why bother framing content that can sustain a relationship for more than a single news cycle? The availability of constantly changing headlines makes it difficult to sit down to read a missive that conveys lasting ideas, builds community, makes promises that the contributor actually plans to keep. In comparison to today's 280 character sound bites, this is a humongous document. Those who preserved it divided it into 52 chapters. I mean, you really don't think that Jeremiah scripted these rants in chapter and verse. It's no wonder that few people bother to read it in its entirety. But here we are, generations later, reading the ancient blog of a storefront preacher whose reputation for weeping and wailing resembles a temper tantrum prone teenager. These status updates, blog posts, and multiple tweets suggest that 6th century BCE listeners were as easily entertained by this ancient cable news commentator wannabe as their first 21st century counterparts. Sound bites of his sermon scattered broadly via YouTube beta system called writing <laughs> make contemporary pundits seem passe. Taken out of context, they're made to say less than what is attended, like cliches for prosperity and promises of immediate gratification on earth. But Jeremiah is not some independent spokesperson sending out tweets that disparage the reputation of the, those he disagrees with. He doesn't complain. He warns with a word from God. Constant tweets about idolatry, indictments, and impending doom span 40 years of his ministry, and since his hearers refused to heed the message, destruction, defeat, and deportation provide confirmation that his warnings were valid. Paradoxically, perhaps, this letter offers a difficult word of hope. And after these last few years, you were hoping that we might find some hope, right? Well, God's looking out for you in, of all places, the lectionary. Who would have thought? Now, Jeremiah doesn't borrow from past threats, saying, say, a global flood. His pronouncement should, however, have bearing on people familiar with foreclosure notices served on their foreparents who try to make a name for themselves through construction and education. Building skyscrapers as a means to notoriety has a history of leading to bankruptcy. And taking out your brother because of jealousy or insecurity has long resulted in dysfunctional communities. And pursuing knowledge apart from God's originally designed paradigm has never served humanity well. Let me put it this way. Your status as, say, a Luther alum, the fact that you have the ability to speak from a pulpit or write a book or, or send a searing email, that's not a sign of your salvation. And it doesn't grant you permission to speak judgment against anyone where you will cause division and strife. And if you think that the political ideology of your opponents gives you permission to practice your own partisan puppetry, then you can fashion your own golden idol and see where that gets you. Okay, somebody's never getting invited to preach for craft or preaching again. <laughs> Which is why it's important to stick with the text. So Jeremiah's accuracy at tracking the storm of the impending invasion from the north was more on target than Al Roker's weather. But he does something NBC Today could never do. He declares these events as a searing word of judgment from God. It would be politically impertinent to describe the agony of the capital city's downfall as a celestial sentence. 
It, it would be professional suicide to suggest the sufferings of a nation is a consequence of allowing wicked people to flourish. To rhetorically assert that we cannot avoid the horrors of war, the threat of hostile invasion, the collapse of trade and industry, and the coming disasters and devastation, because they are divine decrees, shouldn't even be voiced on the road to retirement. You can ask a contemporary Jeremiah about that. And yet maybe we would do well to concern ourselves with the reasons for the divine punishment so we can truly appreciate the divine promise. It's appealing to accept the promise of prosperity as potentially applicable. It's alluring to call ourselves friends of God with a heritage of divine favor. It's exciting to claim the exodus as a sign of our real liberation theology, a sign of our sacred worth, and a substantiation of our enemy's impending demise. But before any word of hope can be given, there first came a warning of horror. Prior to the promise of deliverance, there came a pronouncement of displacement. So maybe we would do well to concern ourselves with the reasons for the prophetic pronouncement. According to Jeremiah, the people had no idea what was good for them. There are foolish people serving among a foolish people. The creator of the universe has claimed that there is none who seek after God. The people are stupid. The psalmist says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But compared to previous generations of the people of God, they've become thoroughly at peace with their culture, causing them to be incapable of transforming society, and leaving them most desperate for a meaningful faith. Substituting an institutionalized religion for the life-changing dynamic of a living faith, religious practice had become a defense against a religious experience. They failed to under, understand that their honor was neither in their race nor their rituals of religiosity, but in their privileged relationship with God to be God's witness in the world. But they, they were skillful in doing evil. Classism is practiced as if the value of humanity is their diploma, deep pockets, and designer wardrobe. Sexism advocates the hostilities between men and women rather than the holiness of marital equality. Militarism provides optimism for those whose preference is the power of the nation state, even while oppressing the nationals whose faith may be identical to their own. Young citizens deployed to combat zones that don't engage acceptable rules of war. And elderly citizens abandoned, forgotten, and left to die alone. Why are we surprised when leaders spew uncensored racism of, over the airwaves? What's shocking about priest immoral behavior? How can we be upset about celebrities caught in adultery? We are a foolish people, living and serving among a foolish people. And this foolishness is neither atheism or agnosticism. It's sinfulness. It's injustice. It's a failure of those called to be a glimpse of God's good in the world to demonstrate fidelity, faithfulness, and fairness. The answer is not converting the masses to an intellectual assent to the existence of God or the acceptance of an intelligent design. It, it, it's not practicing a hospitality that claims God accepts the sin of the sinner, the money of the thief, or the leadership of the unfaithful. Notice, Jeremiah didn't subscribe to a therapeutic moral deism suggesting it's your time now. Activate your faith. Achieve your dreams. Increase God's favor. 
He, he doesn't suggest 21 ways to conquer anxiety, fear, and discontentment. There's no audaciousness to restore honor or rewrite the Constitution. The prophet proclaims the presence of God will result in judgment. And with due apologies to Walter Brueggemann, the record is clear. God is directly involved here in bringing devastation and destruction because of the unfaithfulness of God's people. And the earth mourns. The word was harsh and understandable. No political doublespeak, no moderate mediocrity. The situation would not be a test of faithfulness nor suffering to build up your strength. This is not a cleansing. It's punishment. Most likely, these words were offered prior to the invasion from the north by Babylon. But in hindsight, the edited presentation gave meaning to their defeat. The geographic reference of the enemy should not conceal that the actual source of devastation is the fierce anger of Israel's God. This is not a call to repentance nor a warning to prevent further hardship. This is not notes scribbled on the side of a weekly assignment by a preceptor. This is the midterm grade assigned by your professor. Sorry, you failed. How long had the People of God ignored the warnings that God is not entertained by human sinfulness. Heavenly rest is not watching a video clip of the latest planet Earth reality show. God is not passively watching our practices of injustice like a viewer of Big Brother. God's ticked off. Reading Jeremiah, I really wanted to say some harsher words, but I didn't know how the tweet would play. And so came the prophet's warning and then the devastation, deception, divorce, desertion, disaster, disease, death, deportation. And it is here, it is here that we find the words that God has the plan for our life. That oft-repeated phrase from scripture is taken from the record of a displaced people who had almost forgotten that they were a people of promise. The prophet Jeremiah wanted them to remember that hope was not a naive, patriotic, and unreasoned expectation that God would swiftly put an end to the power of Babylon and send their exiles back to their own homes. Rather, godly hope emerges in the painful acceptance of the very reality of your enemy's rule in the present moment. So they had to adapt to this situation and learn to sing Zion songs in a foreign land. Jeremiah's assurances point his listeners to a remarkable and a intense inwardness of religious conviction in a secular context. So as you prepare to leave this affirmation and accountability of gathering of preachers, you might well do well to think of yourself as a displaced people, and your people as a displaced people. A people scattered in the global context who remember to sing songs of faith in a faithless society. A people who re whose resume includes a reference to a particular view of the world. A viewpoint that is recorded in this journal of the people of God. Bef because before you can hear this comfort, we must be confronted with warning. Before you experience heaven on earth, we must know the God of heaven. Before we say peace, we must call for piety. When we preach a word of hope, it's not because the church is faithful, but because in spite of her unfaithfulness, God is faithful. The word of the prophet comes when the people have lost the God they forgot to serve. And this word is not spoken to a blessed nation, but a nation experiencing deserved punishment. So if we long to listen to this promise, we must hear that our claims to power have left us vulnerable to the enemy's seduction. If we accept this comfort, then we must recognize we neither build the kingdom nor cause the kingdom. That's God's job. We only bear witness to the places where the kingdom breaks in. 
these words of Jeremiah, rehearsed long after the children of Israel were released from captivity in Babylon, still convey the mandate for a called out people wherever they are located to remember that we are to pray for the city we're in because their success, the success of this administration is our success. God's not going to plop down and take us away. God's asking us to be faithful here and know that in God's time, maybe not in our time, we'll be lifted up. So we're supposed to live, live, and we're not to make memories. You don't make memories. Memories happen. So they're told, build a life upon each and every moment. The moment you graduate, the moment you marry, the moment your first child enters college, the moment your congregation builds its 100th habitat house or opens an orphanage for children with AIDS, the words of the prophet are my words to you. The instruction is to live. Build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. And it, it, it's the command of the garden, be fruitful and multiply. I know that's not Genesis, but Jesus said, go into all the world, which is the most pressing word of this letter. In the world you're in, live this moment. And pay attention to those who will come to seek what it is you say your God offers. Those who came for the healing of Jesus weren't those who were already in the community. It was a foreigner who rec recognized the gift of the blessing of the person of God. So what do our communities look like? Is it possible for one community to sustain the heart hungers of both the PhD and the GED, the unwed mother and the homeschooled adolescent, the migrant worker and the stockbroker? Are those who follow Christ capable of forming a community for the pedophile and the rape victim alongside the state senator and the corporate CEO? Wait a minute, those are the same people. <laughs> what we need to consider is whether our market-driven culture has divided those image bearers of God into consumers that should be segregated by age, race, gender, and economic status. That's the world we live in. But when we live the abundance of God, everybody sees it. And so the record of the letter to Timothy describes a transformed Paul who realizes this good news is not just for his people. It's for the foreigner too. And maybe he was thinking of the words of Jeremiah when he wrote to Timothy, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Maybe those are the words of Jeremiah that he is remembering when he says to Timothy, endure. How long do we have to endure? It may not be our lifetime. But on the other hand, like Paul, we're, we're thinking after Jesus, after we've seen God overcome death, after we've seen that God can handle our enemies. So this word is not merely a word 
for the future. It's to recognize that even now, in the midst of chaos, God's presence creates good in the universe. Even now, the God of Abraham and Adam, the God of Adam and Eve gives us a covenant before sending us out into exile, famished in the shame of sinking our teeth in portions of indulgence. Even now, social displacement is not the end of the story. The God of Cain provides protective custody for those bearing the guilt of the execution of another human. Even now, the God of Abraham and Sarah seeks the elderly, even those worn down by unproductiveness and jealousy, and God gives them strength to guide the next generation to be a holy people, a people who live the moment in this world as part of a community of every nation, tongue, tribe, and who work and walk and worship together as the children of a living God. Even now, the God of Joseph is interrupting family feuds so that a hated brother with a dream can grow up to be a decision maker that brings equity to a community and family. Even now, when hope unborn dies in systems of abhorrent labor practices, the God of Israel breaks the government's back and offers humanity a handbook for holiness. Even now, the God of Isaiah in Paul, who once revealed his glory in a temple made by hands, has promised to let his grace slip through cracked jars of clay, the earthen vessels of humanity. We who are named, according to John Wesley, transcripts of the Trinity. So even now, in the midst of trials and famine and darkness and sword, there's, there's hope for the world. And I know I don't have time for this, but there's a, there's a song that is close to the one that we're singing that made me think of a word that I learned from Jeremiah Wright. It talks about how in the midst of the worst, the famine, the darkness, the destruction, when we're surrounded by the enemy, that we can give the same promise that Jeremiah gave, live. The story is that there was a ship that had sunk in a, outside of a bay in Virginia, and for years people had, had been trying to get that ship out. It had been sunk so long nobody remembered in which war it was sunk. They didn't know if it was in World War II or World War I or perhaps even the Spanish-American War. But somebody thought that there had to be something valuable left to salvage on that boat or from that boat, and they just couldn't get the boat up. And they tried cranes and powerful, sophisticated machinery using the latest technology and physics, but nothing worked. And the boat stayed right there, stuck. Until one day, a man looked at the boat in low tide, and he got to grinning. He went and he got him some rope. And he proceeded to tie one end of the rope to every part of the boat that he could see protruding out of the water. And he tied the other end with no slack to his own ship. And then he sat back and he waited for the tide to roll in. And when the tide came in, God, through the combined power of the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, did in one afternoon what man and many moons and all his technology and equipment had been unable to do. God lifted that old boat right up out of years of mud and dirt and slime and grime, just using the force of the tide. God's word is like that. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, and somebody here has been sunk so long that nobody remembers how long you've been down there. Somebody told you that you had worth, that you were somebody, that something in your life was salvageable, but all of your self-help books and all of your self-esteem techniques just can't seem to get you unstuck. But Jesus, the Word made flesh, 
Jesus has an old ship of Zion, and he'll tie the rope of grace around your main mast, and he'll tie the rope of his word around your heart, and, he, and then he'll let the flooding, winsome tide of his precious blood lift you until you are safe. You just let the tide come in and watch what happens. God's throwing out a rope this morning. One rope says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Another rope says he was wounded for our transgressions. Another rope says whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Another rope says that they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Another rope says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Another rope says for by grace you are saved through faith. Another rope says weeping may endure for the night but joy comes in the morning. The rope of grace will cause your chains to fall off. The rope of God's amazing love will free you from condemnation. I've got a feeling everything is going to be all right because God's got a rope throwing it out for you and however your world might be dark and deep in pain, Live. Amen. Amen.